Hello, everybody. Uh, please, very pleased to be here. Uh, again, this is uh, John Wong. Um, I've been with um, working with AWT slash Advanced Ag for uh, going on 20 years, and it's just been uh, a, a fabulous journey. And instead of um, putting people uh, possibly to sleep with excessive technical details, of course, I'll include plenty of that, but I really want to give a perspective on the journey that we've traveled, um, the past, what we learned, the present, uh, what we're doing, and the future, uh, what's coming down the pipe. Uh, they're all interesting. They all help you understand what's going on, and it should be uh, hopefully informative and interesting. To uh, go ahead and uh, get to the next slide. Sheva, do I have, there we go. And to start off with this, um, as this is uh, devoted to agriculture, it's, it's really about plant growth promoting bacteria. And, you know, it's a relatively common name, uh, PG, PB, uh, sometimes referred to as PG, PR, instead of bacteria, rhizobacteria. And that comes from the fact that uh, the rhizosphere, it's a narrow region of soil that's directly uh, influenced by root secretions and uh, microbial activity, uh, including both bacteria, fungal, and, and other. Uh, I think the important thing for us to know is that the PGPB, plant growth promoting bacteria and fungi, occupy the rhizosphere, and uh, they both have direct and indirect beneficial effects on the plant when um, working properly. Uh, and we all know things don't always work properly. There are uh, pathogens and uh, the effects of um, uh, naturally occurring microbes can be um, detrimental as well. Uh, but we're focusing on the uh, promoting bacteria. So we're going to talk a little bit about what that really means. And this here's a slide that gives uh, the mode of action or, or the various mechanisms uh, for plant growth promotion. And on the left side of the screen, we see what uh, is commonly called direct uh, promotion. Uh, essentially biofertilizer activity. Uh, on the right side, we have what is typically called indirect uh, promotion. And we're going to talk a little bit about each of these. And I think it, it's important to understand that um, without these uh, interactions between microbes and plants, uh, we, we wouldn't have anywhere near the success that we need to have to feed our people, stay in business, and keep the environment safe. So on the, on the left side of the chart, in terms of direct uh, mechanisms, uh, Nitrogen fixation, which is the process of taking atmospheric nitrogen and converting it into ammonia and into uh, proteins uh, uh, thereby. So that is a possible way to uh, reduce nitrogen fertilizers. Uh, phosphate solubilization is, is a very important factor. I think we all know that uh, you know, not all the phosphate that gets applied or the phosphorus that gets applied is utilized. Uh, alkaline soils uh, tend to precipitate phosphorus into uh, one form and um, low pH uh, soil, we, we see a, a different form, but the phosphate, the, the PO4 uh, minus three form is the bioavailable, that's uh, orthophosphate. And, Phosphate solubilization means taking the existing phosphorus in the soil that's in a not available form, and the microbes can solubilize that into the bioavailable form. Very important uh, for utilizing whatever P you're applying, and uh, especially in, in those uh, soils where you know additional phosphorus. Uh, uh, addition is limited or even banned. In some cases, uh, phosphate solubilization is, is just extremely important. Um, the same thing with potassium solubilization. Siderophores are 
just a uh, small uh, transport mechanism uh, for, for getting iron and other minerals uh, from the uh, rhizosphere into the plant. Then of course you have hormone production, you know, indole acetic acid, uh, cytokinins, uh, gibberellic acid, ethylene. These are uh, all familiar to, to many of us as uh, key hormones that uh, regulate and boost plant growth. And then on the indirect side, um, you have an antibiotic production. There are a variety of products on the market that uh, are used to uh, kill one or another uh, pest. Uh, antibiotic is part of that. Uh, hydrolytic enzymes, uh, this is um, uh, a class of enzymes that uh, is basically cleaving uh, large compounds such as proteins and starches and cellulose and uh, breaking it down into simpler soluble uh, materials that can actually be utilized by the plant and pass through the various uh, barriers that exist between the soil to the rhizosphere to the interior of the plant. There's uh, microbes that help provide uh, resistance to various diseases. Uh, you know, the um, emphasis today will largely be on the direct plant growth promotion. Uh, indirect's important as well, but I just want everybody to understand that uh, there are well-known mechanisms of uh, plant growth promotion done by microbes. And that becomes very uh, integral into this discussion when, when I discuss how the organisms that we supply add the functions listed in this table uh, in, into the soil. And we'll come back to that theme of the functional uh, nature of our products uh, during my presentation. When we talk about plant growth promoting products, uh, essentially microbial additives intended uh, for plant growth promotion, from a common sense point, several things are, are absolutely crucial. Uh, first, the microbial species have to be safe for the crops, the farmer, and the environment. That mixture, or, or in some cases, it's single strain uh, from some companies, uh, whatever the product is, and whether it's an aqueous or a concentrate or a powdered form, it has to have a useful shelf life under practical storage conditions. So it has to get from the manufacturer uh, transported to the farm, stored uh, under real life conditions and, and still be viable uh, once applied. And here we get back to the word functions again, the product must provide the key functions to the target crop under fuel conditions. And when we talk about functions, uh, we're really talking about that uh, chart uh, one prior where we're looking at direct and indirect plant growth promoting mechanisms slash functions. And of course, for all of us, uh, the cost benefit to the farmer must be positive, taking all factors into account. Uh, not only the cost of the product, not only the changes in uh, agricultural inputs, of, of course, the yield, the output, um, the cost of application, uh, all of the above, uh, for it to be practical, the cost benefit ratio has to be positive. <clears throat> In our case, uh, we're bringing a multi-species product that has a very broad functional spectrum. It meets the above criteria and, and, and literally it's taken 35 years of development. And that development has of course a past, a present and a future. So I'm going to begin by uh, going through a little bit of what has gotten us here, so the past. This is a little bit of my history, uh, you know, building the foundation for ACF products. Uh, from 1985 to 1995, I really concentrated on wastewater treatment. And I worked on the development and application of bacterial products for improved wastewater. Uh, you know, examples might be digestion of sludge in lagoons. Uh, for example, the lagoon, 62-acre uh, lake that uh, Joshua uh, described in his session, reduction of fat and grease buildup in sewers, uh, 
improvement of nitrification process. These are things in wastewater that are challenges uh, for wastewater plants globally. And these are the uh, uh, three main things that uh, I was really concerned with from that 85 to 95 timeframe. In any of these discussions, there's really one central question and it applies to any microbial additive. And it applies whether the target site is a wastewater treatment system or 10,000 acres of soil. And the question goes like this, uh, how might, if we can go back one slide, how might a comparatively small dose of microbes, uh, namely the commercial microbial product, how does that small dose cause a positive change in a large pool of microbes, be it the sewer plant or the target soil. And since I've been doing this since 1985, I've heard that question maybe a thousand times a year, multiply it times a lot of years. <laughs> and, and believe me, it's, it's been asked and it's an extremely legitimate question. So as we go on to discussing that on the next slide, what we hear a lot of times, uh, CFU, colony forming units, the numbers of microbes, uh, a lot of uh, people are interested in, you know, how many are there per gram, how many per ml, how many in a gallon bottle. And what I want to illustrate is that the numbers really do not tell the story. Numbers alone uh, don't tell you one thing about what your microbes are going to do. And you know a very simple fact here, um, a case, a case study. There are literally massive numbers of microbes capable of digesting fat and grease in any uh, sewage plant. Uh, they're always there in the sewer system. If if you look down uh, the lower right corner in Table Five, it's showing that in raw sewage there's between 40 to 110 million. CFU cells per every milliliter of sewage. So multiply that out and it's a massive number of organisms, many, many of which can digest grease and fat. And yet fat and grease always build up in sewer systems. Uh, it's just uh, a fact of life. Uh, despite these massive numbers of organisms that have the capability to digest fat and grease, the stuff builds up. So it proves the number of bacteria by itself just does not tell a story. And one of the key things behind this is, is really about population dynamics. And whether you have the soil or a sewer system, you're talking about a culture, you have uh, many different types of bacteria, fungi, uh, all different genus species uh, and you know huge numbers. And when you have that situation, um, some of those organisms are gonna be growing quickly, reproducing, and some will reproduce more slowly. Uh, you know, bacteria, for example, uh, reproduce uh, in a binary fashion, now one, Two turns into four, turns into eight, etc. And the chart below is, uh, it has real world time intervals, but what it is is uh, just a, a simple way to understand what an advantage it is for bacteria to reproduce quickly. Uh, here we have just five hours in a growth environment. Uh, we start with uh, two different bacteria. One we'll call a, which takes 30 minutes to duplicate, and the other we call B, which takes 60 minutes to duplicate. And after just five hours of that uh, process, you have over a thousand of type A and just 32 of type B. So in that five hour period, uh, let alone uh, the weeks and months involved in a growing season or uh, any real world, uh, Time frames that we're talking about, uh, the faster reproduction uh, gives that particular organism a very, very great advantage 
in terms of surviving and dominating in the popu population. And the bottom line is that in order to uh, survive mixed culture population dynamics, uh, the bacteria uh, which have a limited supply of material and energy, whether in wastewater or in soil, um, when they reproduce quickly, they can survive. When they reproduce slowly, uh, they're going to tend to vanish because of the uh, massive, for example, uh, 1,024 versus 32 uh, numbers that we saw in just five hours in the previous slide. When the organisms are making, for example, uh, hydrolytic enzymes uh, that digest fat or proteins uh, that occupies some material and energy. Uh, those bacteria doing that are re reproducing more slowly. When the bacteria are actually biochemically producing the enzymes and hormones and so forth uh, that deliver the functions needed to promote plant growth, just by definition, they are at a competitive disadvantage compared to the other microbes in the mixture that are really channeling all their material and energy into reproduction. So what happens in the real world is that you have a reduced level of functional activity and the remainder of the organisms uh, that constitute the vast bulk of any of the biomass are simply uh, growing and reproducing as quickly as possible. And therefore the needed functions, whether it be in a sewer plant or in a soil, they're typically not provided at the rate that would optimize growth. Of course, these functions are always present at some rate, but to, to optimize what's going on, you need to ensure that all the functions are being provided. And essentially this is why numbers or CFU of the organisms do not tell the whole story. Bacteria that are providing the needed functions reproduce more slowly. And again, that's just by definition because of the chart we saw. And the organisms self-regulate towards rapid reproduction and away from providing the needed functions. And this is uh, both a, um, a simple uh, fact of the math and it's also an opportunity for us to tailor our organisms without engineering them. And we'll talk about the procedures uh, that tailor the organisms to provide the functions at, at a higher rate than those in the soil. So I define the problem, which is that the expression of these important plant growth promoting functions that slows down the reproduction rate of the bacteria. Uh, that's the problem. Well, we have solved that problem uh, and we're always improving how we're doing it, but for now it is solved in terms of optimizing how these functions are expressed. You know, once we understood that the functions were more important than the bacterial species or the counts, uh, we really developed two different methods uh, to circumvent the, this uh, otherwise unavoidable difficulty. Method one is really the, uh, the key thing to focus on here. And this 20 year program resulted in microbes in a bottle that expressed the needed functions and at a high rate, uh, when added to the target, whether the target be soil or sewer or lakes and ponds. And essentially the cycle goes like this, growth of microbes on selective nutrients. And you might imagine that growing them on different nutrient types might influence uh, what they're used to and uh, what they do. After the growth, uh, we store the microbes in special media and that may be uh, with a mix of microbes or uh, in high oxygen or low oxygen environments. Uh, and that storage goes on long enough so that the fit 
organisms in that environment survive. And at the end of that storage period, uh, we evaluate the aged microbes for the enhanced expression of functions. And this goes on with a number of microbes with a number of functions in all these different cycles, uh, but essentially the growth storage and evaluation that cycle is repeated until satisfactory. That thing has gone around in a circle countless times uh, over the years. And we are very happy with what has resulted in uh, functionally superior uh, product with uh, excellent shelf life. And uh, the evaluation is something that you'll see as the entire day goes on in terms of our various case studies. A second way of optimizing the expression is with these British units. You know, we bring the prepackaged uh, uh, bottled uh, aqueous and uh, boxed powdered uh, microbes and nutrients in a very set uh, ratio into the brutus units and the specific conditions uh, of growth allow for enhanced functions and enhanced numbers. So this brutus is essentially converting uh, say 10 units of product uh, that's bottled and packaged into a thousand units of product that has greatly higher numbers and still has the optimally built-in functions, extremely powerful when applied to the field. A little bit more of the history, you know, it's in, in terms of shelf life, uh, my first U.S. patent was granted back in 1987 and it was for conferring a long shelf life to a wastewater treatment bacterial additive. Uh, you know, that was uh, an additive approach uh, as we've gone through the years uh, with this uh, cyclic program of growth storage and evaluation, uh, we've eliminated the need for the inhibitor additive and just have the organism stable in the packaging. And in this process, uh, we have the functions uh, built in and the storage is, uh, completely practical where anything delivered to any customer, you know, has essentially a two year shelf life after delivery. And that's uh, been something that uh, is extremely important as we expand our operations globally. Now, since the 80s, uh, you know, there have been some main accomplishments uh, the shelf life of the aqueous and powdered bacterial products, uh, extremely important. Uh, understanding the population dynamics and what that means in terms of slow growing and fast growing bacteria with the slow growers uh, providing the functions and being able to put that into the final products, you know, after this uh, ongoing, repeated, many iteration cycle of growth, storage and evaluation. You know, a, a number of additional US patents for optimizing the hydrolytic enzyme production, uh, slow release matrix, uh, just some examples, uh, extensive work in lake remediation that uh, Joshua gave some discussion to earlier. And that's uh, really aided us in development of nitrification products, which is conversion of ammonia to nitrite to nitrate. And in general, the nitrate is uh, extremely uh, important to agriculture as it's uh, a preferred nitrogen source in most situations, uh, especially once you know, leaves and so forth are present. And uh, of course, how microbes interact in phosphorus chemistry has been extremely important as well. The fact is, I, I want to thank uh, Joshua and Advanced Ag. The, the research that they've funded and uh, contributed, conducted over the years has really brought us to the present. 
where our ACF bacterial products really have proven effective as plant growth promoting bacteria. Just summarizing that it, it's really all about the functions and not the numbers. Uh, growth, storage, evaluation, rinse and repeat until satisfactory. Uh, this has gone on uh, for many, many years. Uh, some of the methods are proprietary. Of course, uh, the process took decades. As we look at it here, uh, we will give uh, one particular example. And as we go through this, I'm going to give uh, one example of how we've optimized one of the functions uh, and by using specialized nutrient conditions, uh, nutrient uh, makeup when growing our organisms. As I said at the beginning, nitrogen fixation is a process by which molecular nitrogen in the air is converted into ammonia or nitrogenous compounds in the soil. Carbon fixation is a process by which carbon dioxide, CO2, is converted into organic carbon. Uh, the organism pictured here, it's uh, Rhodocinomonas palustris. Uh, its uh, metabolic versatility is uh, almost unparalleled in the microbial world. It'll grow aerobically, anaerobically, it harvests light. Uh, it also fixes nitrogen and carbon. Uh, there's ongoing research where uh, it's being looked at as a uh, possible solution to uh, the CO2 component of greenhouse gases. It produces hydrogen. It's an extremely valuable, well-studied organism. We use a variety of methods to ensure optimal nitrogen and car carbon fixation with our rhodocinomonas. And just to give an example, uh, a typical growth media for this organism, and you see the um, red pigment in the flask on the right, uh, it'll have inorganic and organic components. Uh, of course, phosphorus, nitrogen, magnesium, iron, calcium, uh, some various trace elements, and uh, almost always you'll have something like a half a gram per liter of yeast extract or Phthalate, uh, sometimes acetate, but these are large quantities of organic compounds that are used to grow the rhodocinomonas. What we've been doing for many years, we isolate the rhodos on special growth media uh, that literally includes zero nitrogen and zero organic carbon sources. And that concept has been incorporated into the grow, store, evaluate cycle uh, for many years and in, in so many iterations. I'm showing here on the uh, left uh, a special plate media that uh, contains no soluble organic compounds, not even small residual amounts. It has exceptional clarity and temperature stability, so we can work with it in all different conditions and uh, over longer periods of time than, than normal media. And again, uh, this plate contains zero nitrogen so that anything that grows, when Rhodocinomonas grows on it, it has to take nitrogen gas from the air and it contains zero organic carbon, meaning that CO2 uh, has to be pulled. In, in other words, for these rhodocinomonas to grow at all, uh, they have to uh, fix nitrogen and fix carbon. And by doing this so many times repeatedly with our grow, store, and evaluate, uh, we've ensured the functionality of the nitrogen and carbon fixation and along with the shelf life of this organism in the product mix uh, of organisms that we uh, sell commercially. This is one example uh, to give you an idea of, of some specifics. And as you'll see, you know, we uh, have uh, five specific bacteria in the uh, Canadian samples. Uh, elsewhere in the world, uh, we have uh, six and sometimes additional organisms, but they've all been subjected to the same gross store and evaluate cycle. 
And again, this here was just one example of how you can do it. What we consider uh, most important is the fingerprint of functions. And this is specific to the Canadian uh, product offering where there are two different bacillus organisms, the rhodopseudomonas and two nitrifying bacteria and listed down the uh, left side uh, at the top five uh, protease, amylase, lipase, cellulase, chitinase. Those are all hydrolytic enzymes that are produced by the organisms, the pluses. A double plus is very strong function. A single plus is a it's functional, but not as strong. Negative sign means it doesn't do it at all. And you can see as you look across all the different functions, which organisms uh, are doing a greater share for each of the important uh, functions. And as you can see, the uh, uh, P-solubilization, nitrogen fixation uh, are done primarily by uh, bacillus lichenoformis and the rhodopseudomonas. Uh, it's important to note that all five of those organisms are considered biosafety uh, class one, which means they are not harmful to uh, humans or plants, or animals. Uh, they have an absolutely uh, excellent safety record. And you can think of this table as the fingerprint that uh, lets you know that all of these functions are present uh, whenever you're using uh, our core uh, ACF SR bacterial product. And the bottom line again, the CFU do not provide the value alone. It's the functionality provides the value. And then as long as the functionality is there, the greater numbers of course uh, then become uh, value added. We're going to move on to uh, uh, the present and work into the future, uh, Kytotrol for pest control. And we've been working at the laboratory level intern internally and university partners in developing Kytotrol for nematode and fungal pest infest infestations. We've done all sorts of uh, university trials. Uh, we've worked on golf courses and uh, hemp growth and uh, peas and lentils, uh, you know, all sorts of different uh, target crops, uh, ginseng in China, all sorts of different uh, applications. The key is that uh, it's really, really working well. The reason is uh, that we build a chitinase function uh, into our functional fingerprint. And when you look at a fungal cell wall. All fungal uh, species have this cell wall, which has chitin as a main structural component. Uh, you see there uh, that the chitin uh, is included and chitinase will digest that cell wall. And the bottom line is that uh, it's proving extremely effective in uh, fungal control. I'll give one example. Uh, Four reports were available, but here I'm, I'm really going to try to summarize. This is in a banana plantation. A black cigatoka is a fungal disease, uh, which, by the way, in Florida in the U.S., has completely eliminated commercial banana farming uh, because of the seriousness of the disease. And this here is a randomized uh, uh, test control uh situation that was uh, done relatively recently. Here we have um, the way the farmers uh, in the Dominican Republic and other countries work is by an index called evolutionary development of the disease. And this takes into account uh, leaf eruption rates, uh, growth rates, uh, spotting, uh, visual indicators of fungus, et cetera, all things that the farmer can do uh, they put it into an algorithm and they get a, a, an index. And, you know, as the fungicides are both toxic and expensive, you don't want to apply when not necessary. So the farmers use this index and it is uh, the case where if the index shows uh, typically above 200, 
it means it's time for a fungal application. If it's below 200, uh, it means that they're relatively in the clear. Uh, we had in this particular trial, uh, the fungicide use was uh, Phyton 27, uh, which is copper-based. Uh, and then we had uh, a powdered ready to use Kytotrol, which was not brewed in a, a Brutus unit. And we had, um, this says activated Kytotrol. What that really means is that the product uh, powdered Kytotrol was brewed uh, under Brutus conditions uh, prior to application. This chart shows the evolutionary uh, development of the disease on the y-axis, uh, the dates of application. Uh, the blue line is the Phyton 27. The orange line is the uh, Kytotrol without going through the brewing procedure. And the gray line uh, is the Kytotrol where it was brewed according to directions. In this case, uh, all the plots had uh, an index that uh, was about 330, which was pretty severe infection. And you can see that in just one dose at the first data point, uh, we had uh, the fungal uh, index uh, brought under 200. And you can see the uh, excellent health of the banana crop uh, with an index uh, almost unprecedented uh, in that uh, area. So this is an example how a very small amount of product applied uh, according to directions uh, in the Brutus unit had uh, really, really excellent fungal control results. And some good news, uh, a patent is coming your way soon. Uh, we recently received our first of hopefully many uh, patents on Kytotrol and its application. The uh, certificates shown on the left uh, happens to be OAPI. And that is essentially uh, African organizations, primarily French speaking, uh, where they really need the product. I don't know if the uh, process was fast tracked or we just uh, uh, had a little luck with the uh, speed of um, uh, the patent being granted, but this is our first of, uh, again, hopefully many patents on the Kytotrol product. Uh, we have uh, patents pending in uh, all of North America, uh, virtually all of the EU, uh, the Patent Cooperation Treaty uh, countries and signatory organization, uh, a repo, et cetera, and everything's in the works. So uh, again, a, a patent is coming your way soon, almost regardless of where you are in the world. I want to talk a little bit about the future because along with the question of how can a few bacteria make a difference when you got a uh, many, many, many bacteria, the, the other question that we receive all the time is how do you know uh, whether or not the ACF product can be co-applied with a fertilizer or uh, a fungicide and that is something that we've, we, we have answers for, uh, we have history on, but we have a technique that we've been working on that should be able to answer that question in great detail. And we in-house and with some uh, uh, certified laboratory partners have been working on uh, a, a process, a, a method uh, referred to as FISH which is a fluorescence in situ hybridization. And what this allows is once you have probes specific to different bacteria and they need to be developed and uh, certified, uh, that allows you to go into a mixed culture sample, whether it be our products or the soil. And uh, when there's a match between the probe and the specific species, and strain of bacteria, the fluorescence is greater. And it helps us to quantitatively identify uh, our species, their uh, persistence, their respective activity or viability, which is proportional to the amount of fluorescence. And this work, uh, you know, we, we have a specialized probe that shine most brightly for our specific organisms. 
And not only is that great for uh, us in terms of our own quality control and understanding uh, the persistence of our organisms in the soil, uh, our greatest hope is to use this. And, and I'm very confident that in the next 12 to 24 months, this will be worked out uh, to use the FISH protocol to determine the compatibility of our products with various agricultural inputs. And let's face it, uh, when a farmer uh, is applying to um, tens of thousands of acres or hundreds of thousands of acres, every time they have to do an application of something, it has labor, it has uh, the timing, uh, the conditions have to be right. Uh, so co-applying products uh, with fungicides, fertilizers, uh, uh, low pH, phosphorus, you know, any of these things, if it can be done without destroying the viability and functionality of the product, it, it's extremely beneficial. And the idea here is now that we have our fish probes specialized for our organisms, we should be able to, in theory, and we're just starting this work now, is to commingle uh, our products with various agricultural inputs for different periods of times and look at the survivability of the organisms uh, using fish. And it's something that uh, really, really excited about. So as we look towards the future, you know, not only do we have the key practical elements worked out in terms of functionality, uh, shelf life, and economy, especially with the Brutus units. But uh, look, looking forward, uh, I'm personally shifting most of my attention to how our products can be co-applied with the various agricultural inputs. And I think from a practical point of view, uh, this will add so much value uh, to the farmer as, as we go down the road. That's everything I have for today. Uh, I thank everybody for listening and I'll, I'll turn it over to Sheva. Uh, 